And we have 11 very interesting and unique people from my graduating class lined up to speak tonight. They'll share their journeys over the last 10 years, highlighting the amazing things you can do after Waterloo and where you can take your career. I hope everyone, um, I, hope their, I hope their stories inspire you as much as they've inspired me. So let's kick it off with Sarah Ebner. She's an architect, an entrepreneur, and she's joining us from California tonight. So take it away, Sarah. So I'm Sarah, and um, I think like many of you, my career is probably my career has probably started at this building here at UWSA, so it should look a little familiar. Um, it's landed me now here in California as the founding principal at Sea Arch, a small and mighty all-female studio. Um, establishing my own firm wasn't always the plan, and it certainly wasn't engineered. It, I would say, grew organically by pursuing what I loved and by being real, really real, about what it was that I didn't love about the industry. And so I'll use the next five or so minutes to quickly summarize what this journey looked like. Um, it had some very humble beginnings. And... Um, Hold on, we'll start us off with 18-year-old uh, Sarah, circa 2005. I uh, finished high school in Northern Alberta, uh, ready to, uh, to pursue a career as a pilot. And getting accepted to UWSA, uh, I think was really the first pivotal moment of my, my professional life. It took me totally off guard. I was, architecture was barely on my radar, enough to apply, but not enough to really focus in on it. Um, before starting my undergrad. And so I decided to pursue it um, mostly because I was curious to understand uh, what the school saw in me that I, I didn't see in myself at the time. And so what I discovered was that I absolutely loved architecture. I um, loved creating, I loved visualizing, working through problems, um, Everything that was process oriented behind every project we worked on in studio, um, I just couldn't get enough of it. And so I was quickly convinced that I did want to pursue a career as an architect full time. And uh, while I fell in love with architecture in school, uh, the reality of the profession hit me really hard and it felt like a very different world. I capitalized on what co-op had to offer. Uh, by by really sampling different firm and project types, I stayed within architecture, but tried small firms, large firms, corporate work, um, more residential work, and I assumed I'd find my dream job during one of the many co-op work terms we have um, during undergrad. And while many in my class did, I was not one of those people. I I dreaded going to work. <laughs> I, I realized that about myself. And the nine to five was a really tough struggle for me. And so I I, I found through co-op that I really needed to practice architecture on my own terms and in a studio culture that felt like home to me. And for this to happen, I imagined I would probably need a license and I would need some freedom to, to choose and, and to carve out my own career. Uh, so after undergrad at Waterloo, I pursued a master's at McGill uh, for a couple of reasons. One was to diversify my education. And um, at the time, also McGill offered an expedited um, MArch program that would get me into practice and working toward a license as soon as possible. So um, yeah, within 10 months, I had a master's degree behind me. And I had also discovered that um, Montreal had a wealth of technical jobs in the government sector, which were definitely not glamorous and definitely not what I, I loved doing. Um, but what they taught me was an incredibly rigorous set of working habits that were great prep for the licensing exams. And honestly, those habits, I would say, serve as the foundation for how I practice and 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 run my firm today. Uh, so yeah, I spent three years cutting my teeth in Montreal after my, my um, master's degree, over 5,600 hours working towards a license. And for those of you out there who are pursuing it or have pursued it, um, it's as good as, it, as, you, as you think it might be. Getting that stamp in the mail is just a fantastic feeling. 
Uh, but with that said, it didn't automatically offer me the freedom that I was expecting. Um, instead, once I was licensed, I found that my job responsibilities increased, uh, my hours increased, um, my legal exposure increased, and my pay stagnated. And I eventually got burnt out. So I made a change. I um, bought a used car from a friend. I gave my two weeks notice and I packed that car with everything I owned, which wasn't much at the time. And I set out for California. Uh, why California? I, I uh, mostly just wanted to visit San Francisco <laughs> and I love the idea of a soul searching kind of road trip across uh, the US all by myself. So um, I was lucky enough to be offered a job en route out West. Uh, I was hired by a solo architect um, I helped him grow his firm from the two of us to five people, and I was able to translate all of the government experience I had had back in Montreal um, to high-end boutique commercial and residential projects. And while the firm was a growing success, uh, I was still working long hours, uh, the pay was still low, and I really didn't feel like even though I was an associate and helped establish the firm, uh, that the studio, it, it didn't reflect my own values. So I made another change. I uh, quit my job. Uh, I, I quit it with the intention of taking some time off to recalibrate. And after a couple months, I ran out of money. And so I ended up just hustling up some small projects and a few bigger ones grew out of those small ones. And that's basically the unromantic story of how Sea Arch was established in 2016. And four years later, uh, the firm has taken on a life of its own. We've had the good luck of being recognized for a couple of awards, um, some international and then Dwell's Best Remodel of 2019. Uh, the team's an amazing collection of value-driven women and our adopted dogs. And so I like to think we've created a bubble for ourselves to explore and expand on what design means to us all. And while having my own firm hasn't meant fewer working hours or necessarily better pay, uh, what ownership does offer is flexibility and agency over your own career. And um, as a new mom, balancing the best of both worlds at home and at work, uh, the benefits are just invaluable to me. And, and I'm, I'm honestly, I, I had no idea that architecture could offer so much. So. Still feels like the beginning. Um, I'm super excited to see what's in store for, for all of you and for myself and all of my colleagues here. So yeah, thanks all. Um, up next, it's Andrea Atkins, architect turned structural designer turned lecturer extraordinaire. So go for it, Andrea. All right. So um, I realized that in this meeting, I there are a number of students whom I have taught and there are students whom I'm teaching right now. So uh, shout out to those AEs who are out there. Thanks for joining us. So um, I took a slightly different approach to Sarah, um, and I guess we'll find out uh, as I go through this. But my current job is I'm a lecturer in architectural engineering. I work for the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at the University of Waterloo. And my background is at the School of Architecture, also with Waterloo, where I did my undergrad and my Master's of Architecture. And then I moved to Toronto and ended up doing some stuff at U of T, but more on that. So a quick roadmap to try to keep things moving. Um, in the last 10 years, finished my undergrad in Waterloo Architecture, rolled into the MArch program immediately because there was a, an opportunity to do the structures certificate program. So I was really interested in the structural courses that we had taken, which were like, there's like three, four maybe. Um, in our undergrad, and uh, I, I kind of was not satisfied with the answer of um, because I told you when I asked why. So I wanted to know more, and so I started to, I was interested, so I was like, okay, I'll do my master's here because I have this opportunity to do um, some engineering courses. So in 2013, I finished my MArch uh, with the structural certificate in my pocket. Later that year, I started working at Blackwell Structural Engineers in downtown Toronto. More on that in a bit. Um, 2014, I started teaching the undergrad structures courses at UWSA. So it started off because 
um, a prof, Elizabeth English, went on sabbatical and they needed somebody to cover. And then the next year they said, oh, the person who usually teaches timber isn't here. Andrea, would you teach timber? And I went, mm, sure. And the next year they went, oh, the person who usually teaches steel and concrete is not interested anymore. Andrea, would you cover? Mm, sure. And so I, I quickly found myself regularly, uh, you know, once a week in Cambridge teaching undergrad students structures. Uh, 2016, I started the MEng program. I figured um, I had been working in engineering for three years and was doing engineering, but I didn't have any ENGs behind my name. I just had all these architecture degrees and I didn't have anything that legitimized like an engineering degree. So I started an MEng program part-time um, specializing in structural engineering at U of T. Um, I still reflect back on that and think like, I don't know who that person was in that moment who decided that I don't have an undergrad in engineering, but I'm gonna go ahead and in, and, and apply to a graduate program in engineering. Like I, I looked in the mirror and I don't know who that person is, but I just went for it, I applied, it was insane. Um, but they let me in probably because I had a few years of engineering work and they figured if somebody lets her engineer stuff at work, then probably she'll be OK in school. So they let me in uh, they passed me through in 2018. I finished my MEng at U of T. And 2019, just last year, I ended up leaving Blackwell. So I was at Blackwell for over five years and I took on a full time lecture position in the architectural engineering department, which is where I am now. And in January of this year, I applied for a professional engineering license with the Professional Engineers of Ontario. So um, if they ever get around to stopping using COVID as an excuse for not reviewing my notes and my education, then maybe someday, hopefully, I will be um, a licensed engineer because I'm not stopping until I'm a licensed engineer. So I crammed all the good stuff onto this one page. What does it look like? What does 10 years of my life look like? Well, we've got um, some down here in this left corner. We've got some graphics from my MArch work. Uh, I ended up doing a bunch of stuff on recycling facilities and uh, digging up landfills. I was kind of the queen of garbage for like a year and a half. Um, and then we've got uh, some of the things that I love to do, like teach. This is one of my classes uh, in, in the e-classroom. I'm sure you guys are missing that space right now, but some of these will probably be your TAs because these students are now grad students. Um, so those are the, the two things on the side. I've also gotten really involved in an accessibility, um, it's not for profit called Stopgap. So this is my buddy Luke at a really big fundraiser for Stopgap in Toronto, because I'm really keen on uh, making our cities more accessible. And all the other stuff is just great work that I have had the opportunity to do with some fabulous people because of Blackwell. So I got involved in um, rec centers and uh, feature stairs and really expensive houses and university projects. And I got to go on site. I found this picture down here. Terry took this picture of me actually on a construction site where I'm all decked out. But it was this fabulous opportunity to meet more architects and work on more projects because my job was the structure. So when you're working in a structural engineering firm, you can maybe take on two or three big projects at a time and really be invested in a different way than when you are working on one big project in an architecture firm. There might be 10 people at MJMA who are pushing out a big rec center but I am the person they all call when it comes to, can I make that column smaller? So it was really a great feeling um, to be so involved in so many awesome projects. So yeah, we've got um, some feature stairs with, which I have done with Nick, who is on this call. Uh, and so this is the Laurentian um, Indigenous Student Learning Center down here. I got to do a glue lamb dome. That was like within a year of starting at Blackwell. Um, there's the Aurelia Rec Center, there's the Guelph, um, the University of Guelph building. So I got to keep moving because I wanted to tell you five awesome things that got me where I am now in one minute. Privilege. I would be completely remiss if I did not recognize that I am a white, straight female who's um, middle class, born in Canada, speaks English clearly. STEM is not easy for me because I am a woman but I would be completely out of line to not recognize that I am born into a world that favors people who look and think like me. 
The invention of the structured certificate program. If that hadn't existed, I'm not sure where I would have ended up for grad school. It really drove me. It showed me that I love teaching. It showed me that I could do engineering and it really pushed me forward. A structural engineering firm willing to think outside of the box. I mean, heck, I only had architecture degrees, but they hired me and they kept giving me work and they kept me around even though I wanted to teach on the side, even though I wanted to do an MNG on the side, they kept me around. So um, big shout out to uh, a company that gives you opportunities and is willing to keep you on even though you want to expand your horizons. Um, a supportive partner. I could not have done this all without my husband uh, because I was doing, like, I was a student and I was a teacher and I was a structural designer at the same time. So I could not do those things if I didn't have somebody who was also keeping me sane, um, you know, doing the grocery shopping, looking after the laundry, because I was functioning at an undergrad panic level of work all the time for like those 20 months. The invention of the architectural engineering program, and this is really the thing that pulled me from working in the industry and threw me into academia, because this is the program that I think I would have done had I been had it been available when I was 17. Uh, it was not, and I've kind of painfully made myself an architectural engineer over time uh, through three different degrees and a lot of work. But the fact that this existed, it draws me out so that I can say, you know what, I want to teach. Uh, I want to be part of this, the making of this program. I want to make people who also know about architecture and engineering. So my takeaways, recognize your privilege, be ready to listen when somebody else shares their story with you. Find the graduate program or no graduate program that gives you the, as many opportunities as possible. Find the company that values you and shares your values. Find your support network and never take them for granted. And that your ideal career might not exist yet. So don't be afraid to wait for it and keep doing what makes you unique. Up next, we have Jeff Christou. He's an architect, a permaculture enthusiast a writer and a very close personal friend of mine. So take it away, Jeff. Can't wait to see your presentation. So after undergrad, I had the plan to travel for a year and I'd actually uh, saved up enough money to pay for this trip. But while hiking Hadrian's Wall near the northern edge of the Roman Empire in Britain, I kept thinking of something that my friend Matt had said to me, that I should start a business with the money I'd saved as opposed to spending it on train tickets and hostels. I couldn't get this out of my head while I was hiking and I decided to return home. After returning, I started a business providing cardboard furniture for university students and this presentation is too short to get into why I chose cardboard, but we'll just leave it at that. As I gained experience and in insight into the potential target markets for cardboard, I evolved the business to focus on using cardboard for trade shows and experiential marketing installations. This is one of the most recent projects I completed last year for the Bentway in Toronto with the artist Sean Martindale. We printed high resolution concrete textures onto giant cardboard letters so that they would look super heavy. And then we had a troop of actors move them around like construction workers spelling out different words. Now with the cardboard business, I've worked with a range of clients across North America, including Elections Canada, Statistics Canada, the Pan Am Games, the Illuminato Art Festival, Humber College, Weston Foods, and many more. This video shows a prototype uh, kids playhouse that I made for an undisclosed, undisclosed client, but you can probably guess who it was. Now, during a trip a few years ago in central Iceland with my friend Nick, who's, who's getting a lot of shout outs today, I guess, I had a very important epiphany. And this is a photo uh, near the location, but we'd stumbled across a garden that was truly magical. And I felt in this garden for the first time, the sensation that humans and nature were in harmony. After that, I began to follow this train of thought until I discovered permaculture. Now, permaculture is a design system, no different than Bauhaus, Art Nouveau, or modernism, except that it is based on ecology, complex systems, and earth care ethics. The goal of permaculture is to cr create regenerative and self-sustaining human settlements. One beautiful aspect of permaculture is that it's focused on proactive, pragmatic, direct 
direct action. So that it's very empowering and positive. Another beautiful aspect is that the outcomes of permaculture are healthy ecosystems, delicious food, and strong communities. I decided to advance my studies in permaculture by taking a permaculture designers course from the University of Oregon. I also started an experimental garden at my family farm to explore these ideas in practice. Now the, the picture is uh, from my garden that I took this spring and even though it looks like a jumble of plants and it looks very chaotic, you can see on the slide that it's actually everything there is edible, medicinal or useful for people. There's a method to permaculture's madness. Now, I was able to take my interest in permaculture and integrate it into my professional work, where I work part-time at Cool Earth Architecture as an architect. I've worked part-time here since master's, since after graduating from master's and also during two co-op terms. The firm's principal, Sheena Sharp, has supported me and encouraged me in my interest to the point that we've now been awarded a handful of paying permaculture design jobs at the firm. And I just want to echo something that Sarah said, because I, the, the, the nine to five grind just did not work for me. And, and I really worked hard to make a situation that wouldn't require me to do that. And anyways, this, this slide shows an image of a passive house project we're working on, where we created a design not only for the house, but also an integrated landscape to grow food um, harvest rainwater and create be beneficial microclimates for outdoor recreation and, and relaxing. Now, recently I wrote and published a book called Utopia, a permaculture vision. The story conveys the sights, smells, textures, sounds, and logic of a civilization built using earth care ethics. I'd been working on this story for the last three years, but last January, uh, uh, two Januarys ago, I guess, I decided to get serious and put my cardboard business on hold to focus on writing. The main character of the story, who is named Hope, unexpectedly returns to Earth and discovers a civilization that works with nature rather than against it, cooperates rather than competes, integrates rather than segregates, creates rather than consumes, values diversity as opposed to uniformity, and looks at or Earth as the source of life rather than a resource. Now, the picture in the background is from a 400-year-old chestnut orchard that we visited in Corsica a few years ago, and it's a perfect example of a real-life permaculture. And you can see the cows munching the grass beneath the, the trees there. Now, I want to end this presentation with, with a recent doubt and concern, and maybe it's from COVID and being locked in my house so long, but, but it might also be part of a larger trend in our society and it just seems like with the way technology in the world is going somehow for me all the roads lead to me looking at a screen for most of my day the fact is i'm tired of looking at screens and i'm tired of sitting at desks and and i i was talking to a, a building contractor on one of our projects about this and he said that even he spends half his time on a computer sitting at a desk so i just don't think I realized in undergrad that I was signing up for an office job to be an office worker. And now today, in fact, I'm actually 33 years old. And hopefully, if I live, let's say, 40 more years, I'm asking myself, do I want to spend the next 15,000 days of my life looking at a screen, sitting at an office? No. Do I have an answer? No. But it's something that I'm going to work on over the coming months. Thank you. So up next, we've got Jane Kate Wong, UX designer, creative director, and our class's resident globe trotter. So Jane, I'm not sure if you're in New York tonight or Copenhagen, but I'm sure it's somewhere very exciting. So I'll I'll I'll, I'll turn I'll turn the presentation over to Jane. Looking forward to it. Great to hear everyone uh, who came before me, Jeff Ebner. Uh, and Andrea, it's been a while. Uh, so to give a little intro to myself, I am based in New York, but actually I'm in Toronto right now. So a little closer to home uh, for many of you. Um, hi, so my path took a little bit of a different route as well um, compared to many, many others. I also veered slightly away from traditional architecture into what is called experience design and innovation. I work at a company called design in New York, and it's a global design and strategy 
company. Um, some of you might have heard of it. Um, they do a lot of industrial design and also a lot of design strategy. Um, some really nice work. Some of the other things that I've been a part of uh, in my journey uh, as an educator has been at School of Visual, Art, Visual Arts in New York and also teaching at Parsons. Um, on the other side, while I have sort of formally left architecture, um, I've tried to keep my fingers dipped in that side by working on the Canadian Pavilion for well, what was supposed to be this year, but actually is now next year, um, and working on a few competitions with offices like BIG uh, to do actually their technology and experience component. Uh, so my work where it is today, um, just to sum it up, is at the intersection of culture, environments, and futures. Um, Ten years, long time to reflect and what has happened. <laughs> so my journey uh, similarly was pretty amazing um, up to graduation, Cambridge Plus, I'll call it, with all the travel and co-ops and being in Rome. Then I ended up in Toronto for a little bit, and I'll go through that, and ended up in Copenhagen for quite some time and did a, a dabble in Berlin, and now I'm in New York where I've been for the last six or so years. So this is what undergrad looked like <laughs> to me. Uh, this was from one of our Rome trips, but it was a pretty wild ride. I think, you know, we, we forged a lot of amazing friendships. Many of us on this call are in this photo. Um, <laughs> but architecture school was one of those things that, despite the fact that I'm not formally in architecture, I think set the tone and also pace for a lot of the work that I do today. Uh, so we ventured into interaction design, experience design. I also did the traditional architecture I love designing, I love making buildings and spaces for people. This is a surf house in Denmark, um, did a lot of interiors. This is a restaurant in LA. I really enjoyed the, the attention to detail, but also the idea that we were really building and designing experiences for people. And ultimately designing for communities is, I think, what undercuts all the work that I do. That also led to after graduation in Toronto, setting up a small festival that combined emerging chefs and emerging designers together. Um, again, many people on this call were also part of this uh, event. And, you know, being and I, uh, and being, I think, should be on this call with Matt, she and I also embarked on doing a few art installations and trying to figure out what our voice was also post graduation outside. This and I'm sure many of you have done co-ops already. You understand what it's like to sit at a desk and be an AutoCAD and Revit all the time. Um, you know, what I was interested in was thinking about materiality in a different way. Also, just approaching design from different angles. You know, there we we have learned in one way, you know, in school. And beyond that, after graduation, I think this was an opportunity to figure out what else is out there. And I worked with Philip Beasley, who some of you also might know. Um, he and I did, a, a, I collaborated with him on one of many uh, installations. And one of them was Hylozoic so gro Grove and Soil, many iterations of this. But, you know, one thing that this introduced me to was an Arduino. And that's a little micro microcontroller that allows you to make really simple robots. And this was back maybe in 2009. So pretty early, I didn't really understand what For me, I was always interested and had fingers dipped in the digital side of things. But doing installations like this really unlocked something in my mind around what is that intersection of digital and physical and where do they actually meet? So. After graduating and after spending time in Toronto, I figured I don't I also didn't want to sit at a desk. I like looked at myself and figured, OK, is this the life that I imagine myself doing in 10 years? And, you know, if I'm going to sit at a desk, which many of us still do, you know, what desk is it going to be and what do I want to surround myself by? And I felt like you know, the, doing architecture in Toronto was great. And it, it really I learned a lot from that, from those jobs. but. I really thought about learning something more in the digital space. And everything that I had looked up um, ended up into this world of interaction design. Things that I was interested in, in 
of interactive installations, um, things that use sensors. And that led to a school in Copenhagen called CIID. And this school, we made a lot of really weird things, um, things that moved, little robots, things that were responsive. And this is where I really learned firsthand how to make things that were, um, that could actually speak to you and speak to your environment differently. Um, one of my favorite projects here that I still love was what we called Blind Duck Hunt. And we had made this sound cylinder that hung from the ceiling that allowed you to play duck hunt only with sound without a screen. So this is one of the teachers and he he is actually one of the people that worked on HoloLens. Um, so thinking about space virtually and digitally in like non-traditional formats was actually something that I was so attracted to. So we had a game where roller that you saw, you could actually shoot and, you know, create this screenless video game. And things like this actually made me really excited to be an interaction designer. But of course, you know, with the spatial component and the things tied to space, I think we, we all know that we live in physical space. So this is something that I really wanted to continue to pursue. That led me into experience design, which is kind of a lot of different things. Um, it's product design, it's service design, it's experiential, uh, and it's also looking into the future. And I've had the great opportunity and privilege to work on a lot of really nice projects while being in New York, uh, including a few things like a connected um, air quality monitoring device where we made an app um, future of retail for Nike, uh, which has been really great thinking about space again, but more from a digital perspective. And thinking through collaboration with different teams, working with technologists, working with strategists, working with art directors, um, not just architects to actually bring these spaces to life and services. So that's just another sneak peek. But at the end of the day, you know, when I think about what architecture has given me it's also given me the ability to adapt and pivot and right now i'm focused mostly in this space of augmentation which is around defining new language and interaction paradigms i feel like some of the lessons here is about how do you understand the physical but also push that into the future and that's something that's a little bit less um less less intuitive but also uses data that we live in to actually make experiences a little bit different um, so as we think about machine learning and future of technology, this is where I'm mostly focused in now and how to translate relationships that we understand as designers, um, but in more forms. So as we think about sensors and computers and what did they see, computer vision, these are all things that I'm working in now. And also just thinking about cross-cultural relationships between architecture, design, um, consumption, how do these worlds all gel together with technology to make something to the future? And of course, you know, I haven't fully departed from architecture. I'm still building installations. And this is like a preview of some something we're doing for the Biennale with a webcam and, and <laughs> a green wall. But um, some lessons that I wanted to share, I feel like architecture is a very broad profession and also broad learning uh, space, I think. Having obsessions and curiosities has pushed me into different spaces and allowed me to take risks um, and embrace change in a very different way. I think traveling has also opened my eyes to all the different, you know, perspectives around the world, which we don't often find in North America or even Europe. Um, and then just reading a lot, watching a lot, learning from other people and then trusting, you know, my gut. And architecture, like I know with what what is happening with COVID and also future jobs, it's not limited. And I think it's been amazing to, to understand how the systematic thinking that we learn in school actually applies to so many different industries um, and the process of research and also designing for people. So that's all my takeaways. Thanks. So up next, we have Lauren. She is coming to us from the Yukon tonight. So hopefully it's not snowing up there, but who knows? Lauren's an architect, a nature lover, and uh, a Canadian Arctic expert. She's been working up there for a really long time. So it'll be great to see uh, a perspective from the Canadian North. Take it away, Lauren. My name is Lauren Holmes. 
I am an architect, an outdoor enthusiast, and kind of a nerd. I grew up in, in, in a, a little town of Cambridge, and I always kind of thought that I would be a farmer because I was surrounded by cornfields, and I, I thought, thought that was cut off the plant knife Northwest Territories in 2007 for my first co-op, and it was minus 40, and there were northern lights over top of my head. I was just shocked and excited about this part of Canada that I knew nothing about, and I quickly fell in love with it. So I did a few co-ops in Yellowknife Northwest Territories, and it was just such a different world for me. It has this beautiful kind of otherworldly landscape just below the tree line. There's lots of hunting and fishing and camping, an incredible First Nation culture, and such an extreme climate, minus 40 winters with no sunlight and then a sun in the summertime that just never sets. It was just so excited we became obsessed with it as many on this call can attest to. And so I took some more co-ops in Yellowknife and I also went to Iqaluit Nunavut and uh, again, just loving about it, the culture, how there's this sort of merger of traditional and very modern culture and art, still sort of a budding uh, opportunity to do that through architecture. And that was something that I really wanted to further explore. So after I went right into masters at Waterloo and it is a very self-directed type uh, program and so you can kind of pick and choose what you want to do your research on and so using my co-op experiences I found my niche of what i wanted to further explore which was this sort of proposed uh, architecture at the intersection of a traditional and modern arctic i had Lola Shepard, a thesis advisor, and at the time she was also um, teaching a class in undergrad of, along the same theme. So she asked me to be her TA, which I gladly accepted. And so we got to work together a lot during those years and it was really great. And then after university, I moved to Whitehorse, Yukon, where I worked at at Kobayashi and Zeta Architects. It's a small firm. Well, big for the Yukon, but small in comparison to the rest of Canada. Um, and my first job there was to office lead for submission into Venice Biennale in conjunction with Lateral Office with Lola Shepard. And that year, the Canadian Pavilion uh, was this exhibit called Arctic adaptations Nunavut at 15 and again along the same theme of an architecture proposal in uh, in the intersection of modern and tradition which was right up my alley so I continued to work at Kobayashi and Zeta architects where I am now a registered architect and associate architect here and we get to work on and all kinds of amazing projects, museums, First Nation cultural centers, the Center for Northern Innovation at Yukon University, uh, multi-residential buildings in the high Arctic, hut-to-hut uh, -hut system in the backcountry of the Yukon, emergency shelter for Mount Logan, which is Canada's highest peak, uh, all kinds of really cool different jobs, all different typologies, all different scales. Um, it's been really fun. And in the end, I am still the farmer that I always dreamed of being. This is a picture out of my front window in the Ibex Valley. 
family just outside of Whitehorse. And I raise pigs and chickens and I have a greenhouse and I forage for morels and I hunt and fish and just generally I'm living the dream here in the Yukon. Thanks. <laughs> uh, up next, we've got Matt Compo. He's a designer, fabricator, and uh, I like to call him the digital wizard from our class. He was probably one of the first people testing out 3D printing and laser cutting before uh, any of us really knew it existed. So he's been blowing our minds since uh, 2005. So it's been uh, it's been a long time. Uh, so Matt, why don't you take uh, take it? Thanks, Katie. Can you guys see my screen and hear me okay? Okay, sweet. So first of all, I'm so excited uh, to sit among all you guys, so many of my close friends and classmates, like seeing the work that you guys have been doing is phenomenal. It's so cool. Uh, like Katie mentioned, my name is Matt Compo. I'm the founder, co-founder and president of Hop Hop Factory. Uh, I founded Hop Hop uh, along with another UW alumni named B. Meow. And so we're a digital fabrication firm in downtown Toronto. And so we specialize in helping young designers uh, and Fortune 500 brands even build really cool, amazing stuff that couldn't be built in any other way. And I'm also the CTO of a tech not-for-profit called Ample Labs. Um, and so Ample, uh, they build uh, digital applications that essentially focus on preventing homelessness. And so right now we have 20,000 users across the GTA and the rest of Ontario. And so I got my start, like all of you guys uh, at UWSA. And so like Katie mentioned, uh, I was fascinated by what was emerging at the time, uh, the technologies around generative design. I was a pretty mediocre student, admittedly, but this stuff was really up my alley. And I thought there was a really cool opportunity to explore some of these technologies as sort of a new frontier of design, similar to how you know, a designer might explore a new material and kind of see what was possible. And so thanks to the amazing co-op program at Waterloo, I was able to get a job right out of school at a firm called Canon Design. And one of the very first projects there uh, was a stadium, uh, a brand new CFL stadium in Ottawa, right along the Rideau Canal. And so we developed parametric systems to control this enormous 10 story facade that, meant, that was meant to sort of emulate the kind of laminar flow of the river nearby and be sort of a shroud or behind the bleachers of the stadium. And so we developed generative tools to help kind of control and wrangle this thing. And so this is the end product, which you can see here. And so there's thousands and thousands of unique elements, all of them custom milled, all of them with custom connection details. Um, and so there wasn't gonna be another way of realizing a project like this, except with these generative tools. And so this is a project I was really proud of. Nonetheless, shortly thereafter, I moved on and founded my own firm, Hop Hop Factory. Uh, because unfortunately, the, oppor the opportunity to work on those projects uh, in the architecture field is relatively few and far between. Uh, they're pretty risky projects pursuing unproven designs like that. Uh, and so naturally, stakeholders are reluctant to spend 60 or 100, uh, $100 million on these types of projects. And so Hop Hop Factory allowed me to pursue this uh, passion at a much smaller scale. And so Hop Hop's first, sorry there. Hop Hop's first product was actually a jewelry product. Uh, so we bought a 3D printer very early on around 2010 when they were becoming mainstream. Um, and jewelry was perfect because if you guys have ever 3D printed anything before, you know it takes forever. And so 3D printing is uh, much more effective on small objects like this. Plus we could use those computational mm -hmm. skills to personalize things and make sure every product is one of a kind and manufacture them on demand as people order them. So it was the perfect application for that stuff. And we accompanied it, accompanied it with what at the time was pretty provocative imagery. Uh, we wrote software to sort of post-process uh, the photos we took at photo shoots and things like that. And people in the public love this stuff. Um, our story combined with the new technology and the provocative imagery got us a huge amount of media coverage for our young company. And so we had full page two color spreads, sorry, full page color spreads in national newspapers. Uh, we were featured on national morning shows, things like that. It was all really crazy. Um, and what that led to for us uh, was an opportunity to take our work to a larger scale. And so we got to take our firm's work to the Royal Ontario Museum and the Art Gallery of Ontario. And ultimately, this led us to much larger clients. Uh, and so today, our firm, in addition to serving young designers like yourselves, we also serve for Fortune 500 brands like Coca-Cola and HSBC and Twitter. And so this is a project we did for Coca-Cola. And this was such a cool project for us because we got to bring our full tool set to bear on this. 
And we got to take Coca-Cola's iconic contour bottle. So the contour bottle is, is what they call the iconic glass Coca-Cola bottle that you guys are all familiar with. And we got to 3D scan that bottle and create this amazing sculpture to celebrate the 150th anniversary of their kind of uh, most cherished product. And so what we did is we 3D scanned it and then we wrote software to digitally shatter this into a whole bunch of pieces. And then each of those pieces was precision carved thanks to the help of a firm named M uh, MCM. Uh, Nick, who's on this call, works there. And so we were able to create this amazing aperture to suspend all these pieces in space at a huge scale, eight feet tall, and create this optical illusion where if you look in just the right spot, these glass shards come together and kind of recreate that iconic contour bottle form as you're about to see at the end of the video here. And so this was a phenomenal project for us. It, like I said, it used our full range of skills and we get to carry out work like this all the time now for other amazing clients. And what that's given us is the privilege to pursue our own software projects that make all of this technology more accessible to, to other designers. And so now we're creating web apps where if you have a CAD drawing or a design you've been working on, you can drag and drop that file into your browser and literally get it shipped to you the next day. So that's sort of the latest work of Hop Pop Factory. And then that success has led me to another firm, uh, which I work on in parallel called Ample Labs. And so I've had the privilege of working with Ample as their technology leader over the past year. And Ample's turned everything I know about design on its head. So Ample Labs builds a chatbot uh, for homeless people that's focused on rapidly connecting them with critical services like food banks and shelters, things like that. And what's unique about Ample is they use a co-design approach. And so instead of the designer being a visionary uh, who kind of sees the whole product through to the end, instead what we do is we employ people with lived experience with homelessness and we work with them every single day uh, in a collaborative environment to basically elicit the, the most important features and needs of those users and make sure that the people who are most served by this product are also the ones who are driving its development. And so at Ample, instead of visionaries, instead of designers being visionaries, instead of having this master party that we're all working towards, designers are facilitators and collaborators uh, that work with the people, the end users of the app every single day who are there to serve particular communities and to measure and incrementally develop features day by day. There's no master plan with the ultimate goal of measuring and improving uh, the kind of outcomes and impact for these individuals uh, and communities. Uh, and so that's been my journey. Uh, it's still a work in progress and that's where I'm at right now. Uh, and so thank you guys so much for, for listening and having me here to speak. So up next, uh, we've got Mark Zupan. He's a designer, a performer and an artist. Mark is also joining us from Victoria, BC. So we have, uh, we've gone north, we've gone west, we've gone to California. Uh, so now we're on the west coast. Mark, take it away. <laughs> Thank you so much, Katie. Um, so wonderful to be joining everybody here today. Uh, as Katie mentioned, I'm streaming to you from the west coast of Canada. Um, I live and work and play on the traditional territories of Lekwungen speaking people, now known as the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nation, and it is a great honor and privilege to live on these unceded territories. Um, I've been coming and doing co-op terms in Victoria with a firm called D'Ambrosio Architecture and Urbanism since I was a co-op student in 2007. I did two of my co-op terms there and I returned after my undergraduate degree in order to uh, pursue a year off of architecture because I didn't know what I wanted to study for my master's thesis. And the architectural industry was a little bit slow at that time and so I went down to a 30-hour work week and I was able to start a little puppetry venture with a friend of mine, Tangle Karan. Um, and we didn't have enough time to build all of the sets and the puppets ourselves. So we invited our community to come and help us. And I was really amazed after a degree in how to design something and consider every little aspect of it, how a community of people could inform a process and infuse a product with all of their creativity. It really got my gears thinking about um, ways that we could design uh, that weren't so overthought and overwrought. Um, and at the end of that year, I happened to go to the Burning Man Festival with a group of my friends. Um, and as it turns out, the Burning Man Festival is a temporary city of 70,000 people in the desert 
for one week each year. And it is probably the most creative, collaborative environment that I could have ever imagined. Um, and so it became the topic of my research for my master's thesis. Um, I decided to go back and volunteer on a large project in order to get onto the desert a little bit earlier. I volunteered on the temple, which uh, starts production about four months before the festival begins, but uh, I arrived two and a half weeks before the festival began on a relatively empty desert. Uh, we worked long days in the heat, in the dust, in order to build something that I was really surprised was coming out of seemingly thin air because there was no drawings on site. And this really spoke to the part of me that was about ways that we could design and build with a lot more collaboration and creativity that just unfolds from the people who are on the job sites and on the work sites. So you're seeing images here of the Temple of Juno that we built. Um, and there was also no rule book for how to use the temple. But when we opened the doors, people showed up and they started praying and sharing stories and leaving behind pictures of lost loved ones. And you realize that people were wired for this stuff. They knew how to participate in this space. They knew how to create their own rituals. And when the temple burned at the end of the week, um, everybody knew how to stay silent and just respect what was going on. And it really blew my mind. Um, so I went back and worked on some of my own projects as well and tried to put these lessons into practice. Um, our camp at the Burning Man Festival is the Mollusk Nation. And I decided to build a shade tent inspired by an oyster. And I hand dyed fabric and designed a very complex tensegrity structure that was a pain in the ass to build. And it looked like shit, pardon my language, but <laughs> it uh, really didn't turn out the way that I wanted it to. Um, but luckily we were all really happy because we were at the Burning Man Festival. Uh, but when we came back, we took all of those materials out to Jeff's farm and we had a really fun time just working with the materials at hand, no drawings, and we designed something that ended up looking a lot more like an oyster. And we still had fun hanging out in it and playing. Uh, this is an image from my thesis defense on Elizabeth English's lawn, uh, where I had the honor of sharing some of my stories uh, from, from that research. Then I moved to Toronto and I worked with Cool Earth Architecture. Uh, I, I'm going to share one image from a built project, my only built project in the course of the two years that I was there. Uh, it's a little cocktail bar called Famous Last Words. Um, and at the end of two years, this is where I was at. Uh, <laughs> I was done with zoning bylaws and building code and I needed a break. So I escaped to the West Coast with my partner. Um, and when I landed on the Pacific Ocean, I knew that I was back home and that I was in the right place for the next phase of my career. Um, I took the opportunity to start a yoga business and a uh, Thai massage practice. And I worked part time in a grocery store in order to make ends meet. And I spent time uh, devoted to my other hobbies. I play in an orchestra. I do burlesque and I love to dance and create with all of my community here. And it brings me a lot of joy. And at the end of that time, I went to a, about, this was in 2016 now, 2017, I went to a, a reflective practice retreat put on the, by the Community Knowledge Exchange out of Toronto. And they invited us to reflect on the parts of ourselves that we might not normally bring to the table. Um, I usually wear my architect's hat when I'm in the architecture office, and I do all of these other things outside of that. And I realized that there was a real strength in inviting all of the parts of myself to the table. So I went back to D'Ambrosio Architecture with a lot more vulnerability around who I was and everything that I do. Um, I continue to make art projects and dance pieces. Uh, this was a dance piece that I made that really explored the tension between being this controlled person in the office and the more wild and reckless part of myself. Uh, not necessarily reckless, just joyful, purely joyful. Uh, and I created this piece with Emily Nimitz, pictured here, a local artist. Um, the last bit that I'll share here is one of the most playful projects I've gotten to work on in the office. Um, pardon me for not showing buildings today, but at the, the start of the, the pandemic, uh, my boss asked me to draft up a floating island with a tree 
And I made a little watercolor sketch and lo and behold, over the course of about four or five months uh, and a couple of design and fabrication drawings to get it into the works, we ended up with a beautiful little swimming platform that the community now gets to enjoy uh, on the gorge waterways of Victoria. Um, hundreds of people swim out to this little island, myself included, sometimes on my lunch breaks. Um, the words of Dr. Bonnie Henry here in British Columbia, be kind, be calm, and be safe. Uh, this is a really interesting time to be navigating all together, but I think there's a great potential for us all to bring all of the parts of ourselves to the table uh, that make us feel whole. Because for me, I was not always resonant with the idea of becoming an architect, and I realized that as long as I fueled all of the other parts of myself uh, that I might not otherwise bring to the table, that I could really enjoy where I had landed at the end of the day. And I'll leave you with the words that popped up on my partner's phone this morning from Sadhguru. Uh, to be a human being means to know how to be. Something or someone should not determine your way of being. Thanks so much, everybody. Up next, we've got Eugenio Villarreal, lecturer, fabricator, and digital entrepreneur. And I believe Eugenio is joining us from Mexico. Um, hopefully, it's uh, you're not experiencing the same cold weather that we are um, up here in Canada. So, Eugenio, take it away. So, just so we can uh, position ourselves, well, right now I'm in Monterey, Mexico. I don't know how many of you know where that is, but that's the northern part of Mexico. So, that makes us really, we're um, really close to the United States. And um, I'd like to share a bit more about my, my city. So, this is Monterey. So uh, Monterey is basically within this plain surrounded by mountains all around. So very different from Cambridge. Uh, anywhere you look, you look at uh, mountains and you have a, a river, a dry river through the center that um, divides the whole city. And well, trying to share a bit about my, my journey, uh, when I was when I had just graduated from, oh, let me see. Oh, there we go. When I had just um, graduated, the big question was, um, was I gonna stay in Canada basically, or was I gonna go back? Uh, back then, Monterey was going through a huge crisis uh, regarding violence and, and crime uh, uh, because of uh, different cartels trying to fight Monterey. Before, Monterey was really peaceful because the head of the cartels uh, all lived there and they decided that would be kind of like the, the peace city. city. Uh, but suddenly all of that uh, broke up. And so a year after, uh, it had been a year after, uh, no, a year before I graduated that uh, Monterey had gone through its like peak uh, levels of violence. So it was then when I was looking at, I was actually um, doing some interviews to stay probably in Toronto uh, uh, or deciding if I was gonna come back. And that's when I just decided to go back to Monterey, uh, hoping that I could I know, add uh, something different to the city uh, from what I had learned. You know? And the first thing I got from, from everybody when I got back was, why did you come back? You know, so. It was really interesting how, well, obviously I had the only way I had experienced that uh, violence and crime was as an as an external person, you know. So being able coming back to Monterey, I was more or less of an outsider, and I could see how everything was kind of shut shut in inwards. People didn't want to go out. Uh, everything was kind of like stalling, and that's when I had to kind of reconnect with the city. It was like an, uh, my old city being a new city. So the first thing I had or that I started doing was uh, I joined as an adjunct professor at the Tech of uh, Monterey, which is a local university in the architecture um, program uh, in the um, social housing uh, project. And that allowed me to reconnect with some of the people, understand more what was going on, what had happened. And this helped me start building uh, a network of people with whom I could uh, work and explore um, what I could do within the city. And that's when I realized how architecture for me was more of a, like a, a tool set uh, 
for to solve things in in my surroundings. So one of the th first things I I started uh, collaborating with was uh, with different events. So everybody nobody wanted to go out, uh, and that's when I realized that I really loved architecture, but it was just so slow. Uh, like building, designing a project, or just understanding what was wrong, and then just having it built took so much time, and like the, the the challenges and difficulties the city was going through needed like faster uh, actions. Uh, so one of the projects that uh, I started uh, founding was called Yossi Salvo, which literally meant I do go out. And it was uh, built to to promote different uh, independent events uh, that were happening around the city, but a lot of people still weren't uh, feeling safe enough to go out. So uh, we were hoping to promote these different events, uh, which didn't have a lot of budget. So we built this, well, I built this uh, this app for promoting these events, which eventually um, led to another project it was uh, Tick Tick, which was a um, crowdsourced type of um, uh, event or ticketing platform. So anybody could sell tickets for any other event. And this way, small events that wanted to, to uh, launch could have, get the help from anybody in the community. And during this period also, um, well, I hadn't heard about Jeff before, uh, I mean, the, the, the origins, but um, back then we talked and I knew he was doing our paper life back in, in Canada. And for me, that I was working in social housing, I saw um, his cardboard furniture as like this opportunity to make sustainable design accessible. Uh, and what was really interesting about this project is that we started working with some local low-income communities who were with people who were just about to build their homes and equip them with furniture so they could start um, inhabiting their houses. Uh, also, during that time, um, just collaborating with other people, uh, I had the opportunity to launch a, a bakery, which was something that I had always had in the back of my mind. Actually, in the School of Architecture, we had a, a, a culinary project uh, back then. And since then, I it always stuck in the back of my mind, doing something with the, the, the art and the procession of, of food and eating, you know, it's how having um, some raw materials and being able to make food. And um, another project that was recently also launched was uh, Vitacora, which is a tool for people who work on site so they can uh, report information back to the office. And uh, just this year, um, we uh, co-founded an NGO that helps uh, local communities and local um, neighborhoods um, get in contact with their municipalities, and we promote transparent municipalities uh, in the city. And well, uh, I think for me, looking back, uh, it's been a lot about uh, the challenges and how those challenges uh, show or reveal uh, opportunities within the community and how architecture, at least for me, has been a tool set uh, to engage with those challenges and create these opportunities. Thank you. So up next, we've got Andrea Nagy. She's a registered architect, a social network builder, a mentor to young designers, and she also happens to be a colleague of mine. So I get the privilege of uh, working with Andrea on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I'll let her take it away. Okay, hi there, everyone. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, thank you so much, Katie. Thank you so much, Donna and Rick, for inviting me tonight. It's uh, such a pleasure to hear everyone speak. Uh, everyone's done such amazing things. And I just can't believe I'm reconnecting with you after 10 years, literally. So I'll get right to my beginning. I knew from a very early age that I wanted to be an architect. And I had a certain vision of what that entailed. That vision contributed to developing me to developing a super rigorous work ethic. and determination over time. And it's something that I still rely on a lot to this day. So I knew that if I wanted to become a licensed practitioner, I'd have to get my master's degree. And that's exactly what I did after undergrad. 
airports, transit, and travel, these were topics that always interested me. So I decided to combine the three into a thesis and adventure around the world. So in addition to studying the history and evolution of air travel and actually designing an airport, a part of my thesis involved traveling to 11 countries and 19 airports in 24 days. I went to other parts of Canada, the States, Europe, uh, Middle East, and Asia, and I got a chance to really study the anatomy of various airports, their sense of place, and how individuals transit through them. It wasn't just about airports and travel. It was about streamlining the logistics of human circulation and intervening in ways that I thought were culturally sensitive and honest. This work led me to my first job post-graduation at a company that had done work at Pearson and various other airports. There I had the opportunity to work on retrofits and additions to existing terminals, uh, signage projects, wayfinding projects, and more. It was right up my alley in some ways, uh, but I was really starting to miss working on urban and mixed-use projects. I had done a lot of that on co-op. So I ended up at somewhat of a crossroads and I had to decide if I was okay with typecasting myself to this particular project type or if I wanted something more. So in order to try and deal with this sudden uh, existential crisis of mine, I naturally and symbolically decided to jump out of an airplane. This, along with some other eye-opening trips to places like Guyana, Suriname, and Trinidad, made me realize that I was most interested in densifying communities sensitively and by way of expanding and revitalizing existing infrastructure. Access to a whole range of mixed uses, I thought, would benefit communities. So this re realization led to another, which was that if I wanted to put my best foot forward in looking for a new job, I could probably really use that architecture license. So lo and behold, the wish came true in 2015. You may recognize these two people, and I could now call myself a licensed architect. Shortly after this photo was taken, I started working at Cone Partnership Architects, uh, where I'm now a senior associate along with Katie. At that time, I had a good feeling about the move, but I still wasn't quite sure what the future had in store. So I decided to just put my head down, work hard, and make my mark in meaningful ways. At the same time, I also started to get more directly involved with my city and community, uh, joining various collectives like the Camden Collective and participating in events like 101 Day which aim to create urban interventions for the purpose of civic engagement. Through my work uh, with these and other initiatives, my personal and professional networks started expanding. Along with three other friends and colleagues, I joined the Concrete Mixer Networking Group with the goal of bringing together like-minded professionals in, design, in the design industry for nights of drinks and discussion. All the while this was happening, the traveling didn't stop, and I felt like every new experience of nature and urbanism helped to sharpen my worldview. There were deserts and caves in Arizona, mountain villages in Korea, powerful urban architectural landmarks, and coastal ports and fishing villages in places like Panama and Mexico. It was 10 years of travel and exploration, home and abroad. These days, I work on a variety of mixed use projects in and around the GTA and Ottawa areas. We collaborate with like-minded developers and city officials to create projects that densify neighborhoods in ways that can benefit residents and hopefully enhance their quality of life. One of these projects, uh, Bayview and Hillsdale, was runner-up at the Build Awards last year, which gave me the opportunity to expand my network uh, to non-human companions as well. 
Another project uh, that I'm currently working on happens to reflect a lot of what I've just spoken about. The Zibi development is a master plan community that's being designed and built on Chaudier Island in Ottawa. In collaboration with other architects, we are designing a sustainable, transit-oriented, mixed-use community that builds upon the industrial heritage of this area and aims to provide affordable housing opportunities to both current and future generations. To end it off, I know that this slideshow of me doing all this traveling is probably a little bit hard to relate to, given our current circumstances. But I honestly believe that the opportunities I've had to visit these places have shaped who I am and how I see the world. There will be an end, I'm sure of it, to this pandemic. And while you can't guess, necessarily get on an airplane tomorrow, you can start planning for something like that today. And, you know, the path I took, it may seem more traditional in a lot of ways, and it was, but the opportunities and successes uh, and rewards that I've encountered along the way have definitely made it wor worthwhile for me. So with that, thank you. And back to you, Katie. So up next is Hudson Pridham. Hudson was actually, uh, we sat right next to each other in studio. Um, so Hudson is a UX designer. He's a researcher and a lecturer and also a dad of three. So he's doing it all um, with three kids. So Hudson, why don't you take it away? Thanks, Katie. <clears throat> all right, so as Katie said, I'm a, uh, a user experience designer. So a bit of what I say will probably be similar to Jane's experience. In fact, I remember uh, Jane and I kind of starting down this path together. Uh, but just to reiterate, um, <clears throat> you know, I think uh, the transition from architecture to user experience designer isn't as um, clean of a break as at least my parents think it is. Uh, being an architect, I always describe it as we're architects of the built environment, whereas a, a user experience designer is a architect of you know, services and digital environments. Um, so I grabbed this off the internet because I think it nicely encapsulates what my day-to-day my -day looks like in this role. Uh, so uh, I'm squarely in this, this little light blue world here. So I sit between user research and um, interaction and visual design. I'm constantly going back to our customers and our non-customers to find out what uh, their experience is like. You know, Eugenio was talking about reaching out into the community to find out the needs of, of folks that really resonated with me. And that was actually what drove me down this path towards user experience design. But uh, like any architect, I'm constantly working with the, the engineers, but this in this case, the software engineers to bring my vision to life and also working with uh, the product owner, the product managers to ensure that uh, what I'm designing is, is both feasible and um, viable from a business standpoint. So I kind of wear that, that hat of user and product owner simultaneously. Day-to-day, um, -day, that could look like anything from uh, conducting customer research, uh, mapping out the customer journey, finding out these key pain points, which are opportunity areas for improving the customer experience. So this isn't a project I worked on, but uh, something a colleague of mine did for FoodShare, uh, and this was mapping out the experience of folks who are ordering food from FoodShare. Uh, their experience at the time was kind of lackluster, and this journey map here really shows that. Uh, or it can be conducting uh, user research either through interviews or through various activities like diary studies or um, sentiment analysis where we have them fill out things just look a lot like crafting. Uh, conducting co-design sessions with our stakeholders to have them participate in the design process. Uh, in this case, we're designing the experience of home care for seniors and what that might look like. Or something as traditional as designing a website or a mobile application, so in this case, designing 
uh, a mobile app for storing a uh, toolkit for how to communicate to patients effectively, which is a toolkit we built with one of our clients, and we needed a website to uh, share that with the public because we felt like it was a public good and something we could use to position our client um, as a thought leader in the space and other work here around healthcare uh, data retrieval and storage. Uh, one of the projects I was most proud of was something you wouldn't even think of a user experience a designer doing was designing a informed assent, not consent, but assent document for children entering clinical trials. So uh, we had a client who felt it was their uh, obligation, even though the FDA doesn't really require this. They felt like it was their obligation to ensure that children understood what their role was in a clinical trial. And they wanted that for three different age categories. Uh, it's truncated here, but three to six, seven to 12, and 13 to 17. So uh, to expedite the research process, we couldn't work with children, but we did a lot of interviews with mothers. And myself being a, a young father, I had a lot to say, especially around this younger age criteria. My son loved the book that we ended up putting out uh, to communicate you know, the experience of Bun Bun going through a clinical trial with her friends. Uh, maybe a little bit uh, wilder still was building out some physical interfaces for navigating through social media and working with seniors for what this would look like. This is a product pivot ultimately uh, into something more akin to a mobile display. Uh, this is just an early research project we did while I was working at OCAD. Uh, and uh, work that I did during my master's thesis and then continued in partnership with an organization that's a, a contractor for the Canadian Space Agency was what does controlling um, rovers look like in a, a non-traditional interface. So uh, as we move out into the solar system, as we explore the moon and Mars, um, being able to allow teams to interact with these rovers in, in a more fluid way. Uh, Microsoft has experienced uh, using their HoloLens, Jane mentioned. Uh, so I was designing this ironically at the same time at OCAD, doing work with VR headsets and what a uh, full body immersive interface, interface looked like uh, where you can look down and, and see a virtual representation of your rover. Uh, so I went through the full uh, design research process and uh, speak a little bit more to that, but reaching out to partners. And then uh, once I graduated, continuing that relationship and trying to bring things to market. So this is all extremely uh, tangential or a little bit all over the place, but my, my um, <clears throat> career path, if you look at it, it could be seen as quite linear. I worked at Stantec post-graduation, uh, then I, went to SAP as an interaction designer, um, worked at Bridgeable as a, a lead interaction designer, designing services and experiences for many years. And simultaneously, I taught as a sessional instructor teaching research and design methods. As I said, I wanted to uh, continue to conduct research. I found being a part of a university enabled me to continue to reach out and uh, apply for grants. Um, so the last thing I did was then I found it was really interesting to build out conversational interfaces and chatbots as part of a service experience. So this all uh, doesn't really paint a clear picture of how I got here, but it began when I was in my undergrad. My master's uh, was a direct segue of this research I was doing in my undergrad uh, that was inspired by this gentleman, Johnny Lee of MIT, using head tracking created with a Nintendo Wii remote. Um, I, I built out a bunch of concepts and ended up wanting to make my own hardware company. And so I pitched to the Ryerson Digital Media Zone. Um, simultaneously, I became more and more disenfranchised with the process of conducting regular architecture. Uh, P3 projects in particular uh, made me dissatisfied with uh, the practice because P3, the scope of the work is dictated to you by another agency. So when we were handed a fundamentally flawed design, we were disallowed from going back to our core users and um, redesigning the building. So I said enough. So I went back and 
fortunately had an amazing boss who introduced me to uh, a number of books and processes um, that helped me build a career in user research. Uh, funny enough, even Matt, who presented earlier, played a hand in this where I, I reached out to Matt and he taught me how to program uh, a rudimentary Arduino system. Um, so all that loops back around and goes through this process of uh, engaging with the Canadian Space Agency and stuff, all happening while my wife and I are building out a, a small family. Um, so these are my two twin girls and my son, Miles. Um, <clears throat> it was always in the books that we were going to have kids, never this many so quickly, but uh, it hasn't really stopped me and her from pursuing our career. In fact, uh, I think our careers have been burgeoning quite quickly, and especially during COVID, they've kept us from going absolutely insane, uh, and they can participate in all of my hobbies and loves. Uh, that's it. <laughs>